and I was friends then with the senior pastor here at the time, who was Glenn Rader. That year, before I was on staff here, um, Pastor Rader invited me to join him and the two assistant pastors that were here then, the two Dans, Dan Cup and Dan Bach, on a uh, pastor's conference out in California. If I could um, pay for the plane ticket, they would let me share their hotel room and their rental car. And um, so I went with them. On the plane ride out, um, since I got my plane ticket late, after the invitation, I sat in the middle. And on one side was Pastor Dan Bach, and on the other side was a free Methodist pastor. And I guess, you know, because there was a big pastor conference, we just happened to be three pastors in a row. Now, if you've ever heard like a, um, a Christian conference speaker, um, they all seem to have a story about a time when they were on a plane on their way to a speaking engagement, and they're trying to get their um, sermon or their message ready for the next day when someone saw them reading their Bible, and this person then asked them a question like every good airline atheist does, and before they landed, that person had prayed to accept Christ, and um, then that person went home and saved their whole village or something like that. <laughs> have you ever heard an airplane salvation story like that? No, I probably have been to too many Christian conferences. Anyway, on my plane, on my plane, I told the two pastors sitting on side of me how much I wanted to have one of those airplane salvation stories. So I asked either one of them if they wanted to pray to receive Christ, but neither one of them did. <laughs> on my plane ride home, however, I was seated between two women, a, a charming 70-something crosswording mother on my right and her very professional information technology executive daughter on my left. Before we landed in Pittsburgh, I did talk with both of them about spiritual things, and I learned that the mother had been to the large church in Southern California that we had been to, and she was very impressed, and I had nice conversations with the younger daughter about spiritual things and about like um, world poverty and um, environmental issues, and I had my Bible out getting my sermon ready for that weekend because this is 2004, so he still had to have a hard copy on a plane, but neither one of them prayed with me. But the good thing was how at one point, the daughter asked me if, she, if I wanted to switch, and she let me sit on the aisle, and she sat next to her mother, and across from um, the aisle from me then was this hard, happy, hearty-looking man who turned out to be Tom Clark Sr. from uh, Tom Clark Ford that used to be in Greensburg, and um, I thought, okay, now this is the guy God wants me to have an appointment with. Not because he needed Christ, because that was evident, because he had this little small Bible out that he was reading, and, and you could tell. But because I needed a good deal on a used car. <laughs> Tom did ask me about my vehicles, but he never said, hey, come on down and mention my name, and I'll give you a good deal. But he did tell me about his son. And the story of his son Joe and his wife Penny is an amazing story. I told this story in an evening service after I came on staff here in 2004, but um, so few of you might recognize it, but it's been that many years and it's real inspiring, so I'd like to share it again. Joe had been successful in um, the car business with his dad. They had a car dealership in Greensburg and they had two RV dealerships. Business was so good that they had recently just bought another dealership, I think in McKeesport, a Chevy dealership, and um, they also had just put a million dollars into that um, motorsports, Tom Clark Motorsports that's in Bel Vernon on the highway there. And Joe also had bought 15 acres of land that he was able to parcel and he was turning it around really quick for thirty and forty thousand dollars per plot. And Joe and his family were set. Around four years be before Tom told me this story, so around 2000, Joe went to his father and told him how his heart was breaking for a group of people in Alberta, Canada called the Hutterites. And the Hutterites are a people who live in Amish-like communities across the um, Central America, United States and Central Canada. 
and um, they're entirely self-sufficient. They're highly skilled in highly skilled in their trades to support themselves. They're not primitive though. They live in nice homes and they drive cars, um, but they have a strict code of owning no personal property. So everything they have is owned by the Hutterite community collectively. Um, they have they don't even have personal money. Um, if the, on every Friday, he said back in the day they would each be given five dollars so that they could go to town to get ice cream. So even like the five dollars to go for an ice cream was given to them. They simply owned nothing themselves. And the thing is that although they believed in Jesus Christ and they believed in the Bible, they were taught and they believed that salvation came um, was only achievable through good works that were performed in the Hutterite community. So Joe, you know, got exposed to them and introduced to them, and he admired them for their devotion to God and for their hard work and for their goodness, but his heart was breaking for their failure to understand really what Jesus Christ did. And um, he said he'd wake up in the middle of the night thinking about the Hutterites, God just burdening him for them. So six months after Joe approached his dad to tell him that his heart was breaking for them and that he felt called to resign to go minister to them, Joe and his wife sold everything that they owned except anything that could fit into an RV. And he moved up to Alberta, Canada to try to reach these Hutterites for Jesus Christ. So fast forward two years later, 60 Hutterite men, women, and children are in one of their very large um, meeting hall slash dining hall, and they're having a meeting. Along with these 60 are 20 to 30 um, regional Hutterite elders. Popes, Tom called them, although I knew that the term was misplaced. In the hall, there were also other extended family members and other Hutterites who were brought in to see for themselves what might happen to them if they followed the way of these 60. The 60 were questioned and coerced and pressured for five hours. An ultimatum was given. Renounce their new beliefs in Jesus Christ or leave. Return to the true Hutterite faith and all will be forgiven. Continue to disobey the authority of the elders and choose to leave, and they would leave now, right now, with only the clothes on their backs. The challenge was finally put in a way that anyone who refused to renounce their new beliefs and therefore wanted to leave was to stand. In the midst of everyone and everything important in their lives, they had to stand and say, I renounce it all for my faith in Jesus Christ alone. A man named Andrew was the first one to stand, saying, You have taught us that the way to heaven is through Hutterite good works, not through faith in Jesus Christ. This is not the truth. Sixty people stood and walked away from everything that they known, had known, ever. They were set out on the road to town with only the clothes on their backs. Joe called people from the church that he went to in the town like 15 miles away, and he asked them to get in their cars and in their vans and to come out and help pick up these people. Each Christian home took in whom they could. Then Joe and his wife emptied their bank account, giving money for rent and furniture and down payments for cars and homes. Joe's dad told me with a big smile. Since then, others in that community came to ask if their good works could earn themselves heaven, why would Jesus have to die? So as I wrote myself notes 
of this story on that airplane after hearing Tom tell me it, I realized that his son Joe had done what Jesus had told the rich young ruler to do in Matthew 19, 16, where Jesus said, Someone came to Jesus with this question. Teacher, what good things must I do to have eternal life? Why ask me about what is good, Jesus replied. Only God is good. But to answer your question, you can receive eternal life if you keep the commandments. Which one, the man asked. And Jesus replied, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not testify falsely, honor your father and mother, love your neighbor and your, as yourself. I've obeyed all these commandments, the young replied. What else must I do? Jesus told him, if you want to be perfect, go and sell all you have and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the young man heard this, he went sadly away because he had many possessions. Then Peter said to him, We've given up everything to follow you. What will we get out of it? And Jesus replied, I assure you that when I, the Son of Man, sit upon my glorious throne in the kingdom, you who have been my followers will also sit on twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. And everyone who has given up houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or property for my sake will receive a hundred times as much in return and will have eternal life. But many who seem to be important now will be the least important then. And those who are considered least here will be the greatest then. Do you see how that's exactly what the Hutterites did? And we can also say that it was only because Joe and Penny were willing to sell everything they had to follow Jesus more perfectly, more completely, that 60 people, and who knows how many more by now, had the opportunity to give up everything and did in exchange for following Jesus Christ. In this passage with the rich young ruler, those who wholeheartedly follow Jesus Christ are promised a hundredfold reward in heaven. And in Joe and Penny's case, it's like Jesus confirmed that heavenly truth by sending a part of that return a little early here. They gave up house and property and nearness to their family, left their family and their home, and they gained a huge family in return. A man named Wilbur Reese wrote a poem. I don't know what it's technically called, but it goes like this. It's just beautiful. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love a black man or pick beats with a migrant worker. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. He's saying that we, some of us, treat our relationship with God through Jesus Christ like having a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. It's like we only want $3 worth of God like when we go to a store and we say we would like $3 worth of that item. We just want a little bit, a measured amount. But our relationship with God through Jesus Christ is not about how much you buy or buy into. It's not about how much you're willing to sell or surrender. It's about how much of your life is His. If you take His cross as yours. And when you give your entire life and being to Jesus, He tells you that it's not about you. It's about living your life for Him and for others. 
Joe and Penny and their family in their unique God-given way are doing what all of us are called to do. Our mission as followers of Jesus Christ, our missioners as His representatives called out of this world to be a part of His body is to be then sent back into this world to tell the world that lost people matter to God. Every follower of God, every follower of Jesus Christ is to have a unique ministry. That's how we serve Christ as part of His community, in, as His church. And we are all called to have a mission. And that is how we reach out to those outside the body of Jesus Christ. Those people who are still in the world and that Jesus would characterize as being lost without Him. This is very simply based on the fact that um, Jesus considered this His mission and if we are His followers, we imitate Him. The mission of Jesus, Jesus Christ um, was to live and die on a cross so that sinners could be put in a right relationship with God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, Romans tells us. Lost people <clears throat> matter to God. Jesus said the purpose He came was to seek and save and to save what was lost. And He's referring to people. Lost people matter to God. The central mission of the church as pronounced by Jesus Himself in the Great Commission, sending us out, giving us a mission, involved reaching out to people who were lost. Go into all the world and make disciples, lost people still matter to God. The most quoted verse in the Bible that summarizes the whole message of the Bible is about reaching lost people. For God so loved the world that He gave His only one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Lost people to matter to God. And if this is a universal mission for all of us, for all Christians of all time, it would have to be something that can transcend time and culture and place, and it does. It can be fulfilled and accomplished in every culture, in every language, in every generation, by every single one of us. Lost people matter to God. In John chapter 17, as Jesus was preparing to leave his disciples, he was praying for them saying, in the same way that you gave me a mission in the world, I give them a mission in the world. Jesus gave his disciples a mission in the world. That's, those are his words. And that was his prayer for the Father to give them that mission and to help them in that mission. And we are his followers. He was praying for us too. In the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says, the most important thing is that I complete my mission, the work that the Lord Jesus gave me, to tell people the good news about God's grace. That's our mission too. That's our most important thing. And at the beginning of this year, at the beginning of the year, it's good to remember what our most important priority should be. Romans 6.13 says, Give yourself completely to God, every part of you, to be tools in the hands of God, to be used for His good purposes. Give yourself to God to be used for His good purposes and His mission. Bill Bright is the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ. Some of you that have been Christian for a couple of decades would know the name of that ministry. You might not know the name Bill Bright, but he, um, he is directly or indirectly will be responsible for what will most likely be more than 100 million people in heaven. Bill Bright, Campus Crusade for Christ. He and his ministry wrote a little, the little booklet, the little track called The Four Spiritual Laws that helped people understand the gospel for decades. People have been using that to share um, how to become a follower of Christ, share the gospel. And he and his ministry, Campus Crusade for Christ, 
also uh, produced the Jesus film, and the Jesus film is being used all around the world, especially in Africa and um, Asia, India, to lead people to Christ. It's been trans translated into, I think, over 100 languages, and over 100 million people will be in heaven. Bill Bright was once, once asked, why did he believe that God blessed his life so much. Why did God use his life so much? And he said, when I was a young man, I made a contract with God. I literally wrote it out and signed my name at the bottom. It said, from this day forward, I am a slave of Jesus Christ. He gave himself to God completely. Every part of himself. To be tools in the hands of God. To be used for his good purposes. Today, I encourage you to make that your prayer. Make that your intention. Renew that intention, that submission in your life. From this day forward, God, I am completely yours. Not $3 worth of me, but all of me. The Bible is full of teaching that says that lost people matter to God. And the Bible is full of teaching that says that telling people about the good news of His grace, that lost people matter to Him, is something that all followers of Jesus Christ are called to participate in. Have you given this mission, His mission, the time and interest and concern that it deserves? Would you choose to make it a priority in your life today. Joe and Penny and the Hutterite people that they reach are a great example that you can't step out too far in faith. The further you step out, the more God will enable you to fulfill His mission. So there's a possibility that somebody today God would be calling you to something extraordinary too. Some big sacrifice. Some big step of faith. Whatever God would be leading you today and however you would respond to Him today, would you please bow your head and pray with me. Dear Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You've given us a mission. We thank You for... Um, this couple, and though the story is over a decade old, I, I bless you for their ministry, and I bless you for the things that you've probably continued to do, multiplying wonderfully in that community. We ask your blessings upon them all today. We pray for ourselves then here today. Um, your servants, we give ourselves to you, and we ask that you would do amazing things in our lives and in our community. We pray that you would help us for the, the conviction and for the leading that you're giving us by your Spirit, for the decisions and the new beginnings that you would be called, call, that you would call us to. Make yourself evident in our, heart, in our hearts and our lives and each step we take as we leave here and we try to accomplish what you would call us to. Let our hearts burn with your heart for the seeking of the lost and help us to take your mission into the world to make a remarkable impact for you. Only by your grace. In Jesus' name we pray. If this is your prayer too, say amen. 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 God bless you.